This video is continuing on right where the previous video left off. We're still in part 080, Matrix Algebra. All the code in this video works exactly the same in Octave as I'm going to be showing it here in MATLAB. And we're going to get into the cross product. But before I do that, I want to go to this web page right here, which I will also provide in the video description. Um, but you can, of course, access it through this document, which is also linked to in the video description that talks about both the dot product and the cross product. So here's the web page right here. It'll show up as a white background, probably for you, unless you're using the dark background settings, which I am. The website itself is kidscancode.org. And it's a Godot web page. Godot is a game development engine that is relatively simple. I mean, it's, it's more complicated than some things such as like Pygame in the Python language, but it's certainly a lot simpler than Unity. And it has a lot of very powerful capabilities for such a simple language. So if you're interested in game development and you're just getting started, Godot is a really cool place to get started. And this is just, it just happens to have one of the best websites I've seen with some really nice diagrams on the dot product and the cross product. So let's check it out. So we are doubling back here. I'm talking about the dot product a little bit, even though I've already made that dot product video. So let's just try and develop our understanding a little bit of what the dot product is. So the dot product of two vectors gives us a scalar value, a single number. And that number is often visualized as the projection of A onto B. Now, what does that mean? So if you take the dot product of A and B, you will get what I like to think of as the length of the shadow that A, the green vector, casts on B, the red vector here, assuming that the sun is like directly overhead of this right triangle that we've got here. I think that's a really neat visualization of the dot product. I like to think of it as this length of the shadow of one vector on another vector. And it works both ways. The dot product of B on A is going to be the projection of the red vector onto the green, as if the sun was shining from directly overhead right here, and we have a different right triangle formed. All right, I'm going to skip most of the text on this page. We're just going to be looking at the diagrams, and actually we're going to skip this diagram too. So the cross product is a different sort of thing. Often the dot product is referred to as the scalar product of vectors because the result is a scalar value, a single number. And the cross product is often referred to as the vector product of vectors because the result of the cross product of two vectors is a new vector. And we see on the screen right here the cross product of the green unit vector, green length one vector, and the red length one vector is this blue vector right here, which does have a different length depending on the angle between the green and the red vectors. But what typically is very important about the cross product of two vectors, whether you are in game development or otherwise, is that the resulting third vector is perpendicular to the other two vectors. And that's what this diagram is really trying to visualize right here. The grid that we're seeing at like an angled view, the green and red vectors are flat to that grid. And the blue vector is either extending straight upward out of this flat surface or straight downward into the plane or beneath the plane. And this is true no matter the green and red vectors. You might think like, oh, well, what if the red vector was tilted upwards somewhat? Well, it wouldn't matter because it would be a different flat plane that we can angle between those two vectors and the blue vector would still be pointing perpendicularly out of it. This is a game that you can kind of play a little bit with your arms. So imagine your arms are two vectors. Try to point them in any directions. Uh, parallel doesn't really work and opposite directions doesn't work great either. But any other directions than those and imagine the flat surface, the mathematical plane that would cross through those two vectors. Now it's important that the two vectors sort of start at the origin, whatever that is. And if you're using your arms for this experiment, the origin is usually like between your shoulder blades somewhere. All right, continuing on downward. This uh, diagram right here that almost looks like a clock and has these two different numbers that keep changing is showing you the dot product between the green and red vectors and also the magnitude of the cross product between those two vectors, not the result of the cross product, which is very important. The cross product does not result in a single number. It results in a vector that's perpendicular to these two. And what you'll see as these go around is that the cross product actually has zero magnitude when the two other vectors are either parallel or facing directly opposite each other. So feel free to visit this webpage and peruse it in more detail and read the actual text. 
but I just think these are some really useful, great diagrams to give you some visualizations of the dot product and the cross product. I'm gonna jump back into MATLAB at this point. All right, so I'm gonna run this code here, control enter, and it kind of looks like a boring result at first. I've got these two vectors here that I refer to both as X and Y, those are their variable names, and as I and J, which at first you might consider a little confusing, and then I cross those two vectors. The MATLAB function is simply named cross and the octave function as well. I don't know if I remember to say this. All the code you're going to see in this video works perfectly in octave. It works exactly the same in octave as it does here in MATLAB. And I put the result of that cross product into a variable named Z. And when I display it out, this is what it looks like. And if you go back to one of my earlier videos, recent earlier videos where I talked about vectors I talked about unit vectors, basis unit vectors, and that's what these are. Basically, it's just vectors that are length one and point along a particular axis. So if we think of the axes as x, y, z, this vector is length one pointing parallel to the x-axis. This vector is length one pointing parallel to the y-axis, and this vector is the result of the cross product of the other two, and it is a length one vector pointing along the z-axis. All I'm really trying to emphasize here is the cross product gives you a new vector perpendicular to your other two. Continuing on down, right? I have this note here that I'm gonna to refer to this uh, PowerPoint here, and there will be a link to this PowerPoint in the video description along with all the rest of this code. So let's just briefly jump over to that PowerPoint. All right, so the rest of this content, if you have the MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition, is in chapter 10, and eventually we're gonna do an example with a diagram like this, but I'm gonna move past that for now. So I already talked about this. Sometimes uh, cross products are referred to as vector products, and the result is always a new vector that's at right angles to the vectors that were crossed. Now, there's a lot of different ways to say at right angles. We might also say that the vectors are normal or orthogonal. So all these things mean at right angles too. Now, uh, the full phrase, if we're saying that the new vector is perpendicular to both the other two vectors, is that we might say that it is mutually orthogonal to the plane defined by the two input vectors. And here is just a little bit of text showing the cross product that I just did. The k basis vector, sometimes represented here as k hat or as a bold k, is equal to the cross product of the i and j vectors. This slide is trying to emphasize that the cross product, much like the dot product, is a series of relatively simple calculations. This pink text on the bottom here is showing that the cross product that you get is simply a variety of multiplications and subtractions. So the x component is formed by the y component of the a vector multiplied by the z component of the b vector minus the a component of the z vector times the y component of the b vector. I really hope I said that correctly and so on. Again, it's a pain to memorize, but thankfully MATLAB is going to do it for us. We can verify orthogonality. We can verify that two vectors are perpendicular by using the dot product, because the dot product of two perpendicular vectors is going to be zero, because one formulation of the dot product is the cosine of the angle between the vectors is equal to the dot product of the two vectors divided by the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector. But the cosine of 90 degrees, a right angle, is zero. So the dot product has got to equal zero. The denominator doesn't even matter at that point. You can multiply both sides by this denominator to cancel it out, but on the left side, you'll be multiplying by zero. So the dot product must equal zero. And we'll see that code verifying that in a moment. Cross products are very widely used. I cannot personally speak to fluid mechanics or electrical engineering or physics particularly. However, I have done some game programming. And whenever you're trying to simulate some physics or do anything with three-dimensional stuff, cross product does come up and it is very useful to know what it does and how to use it. Jumping back to MATLAB here, I'm gonna run the next section. And in this one, I start off with these two vectors, A and B. Uh, it's literally just one, two, three, and four, five, six. And then I cross them and I get a new result. The new result happens to be this vector here, negative three, six, negative three. And you might notice I print it out again. Well, why is that? Because I wanted to emphasize that you could calculate these cross products by hand. Like the determinant, like the dot product, there's nothing mystical or mysterious happening here. It's just a series of multiplications and subtractions to get the cross product. 
but thankfully we don't have to memorize these calculations and do them all written out like this. We can just use the cross function that's built into MATLAB and into Octave. Now in the next section, I'm gonna verify orthogonality, right? So I'm gonna verify the vectors are orthogonal, perpendicular, at right angles, or at 90 degrees to each other, which is all basically the same thing. So I'm using my same two vectors from before, A and B. I'm gonna dot product those, and then I'm going to dot product A with that cross result one that I generated in the previous section. And then I'm gonna dot product B with cross result two from the previous section, although one and two are literally the same vector. I printed them out right here. So let's just run it and see what prints out. And we see that A and B are not orthogonal. Their dot product is 32, which is not zero. A and the cross result are orthogonal. Their dot product is zero. And B and the cross result are also orthogonal, as we would hope, as we would expect. And so we get zero right there. Continuing on down here. This is a question that comes from MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition. Uh, I also have it in the PowerPoint right here, I believe starting at slide number seven. So I'm gonna jump over to that now to introduce the problem, and then we'll see the code that solves it. Okay, it really is just this slide right here. There's no numbers involved. I just wanna show you the setup. So the idea here is we're calculating these things called moment of a force about a point. And we've got some sort of lever, and that's represented right here. And the lever is affixed, it's got a pivot point down at the base, and there's gonna be a force applied to the lever some distance from the pivot point. I often say that this distance is the length of the lever, but that's only true if the force is being applied at the very tip of the lever itself, um, which you can think of it that way if you like. But anyway, the distance is between the pivot point and the point where the force is applied. And the moment of force is simply the cross product of the lever vector, which we're gonna call R, and the force vector, which we're gonna call capital F. And so what we need to figure out are the X and Y components of the right triangles of the lever and of the force. Now, we do need to calculate these in three dimensions, but we're just gonna set the third dimension, which we'll call Z, as zero. I believe that you can do this in three dimensions if you have a properly pivoting uh, lever, but I, I'm not an expert in the physics or the engineering behind this, so I'm gonna go with the example that I've got here. The force vector, we're probably just gonna be given those components. There's a horizontal component and a vertical component. It is going to be important that if the horizontal component is pointing to the left, that it should be negative. And if it's pointing to the right, it should be positive. So in our example, we're gonna use this diagram basically, there's gonna be a strong force to the left, a negative X component. The Y component is going to be minimal but present, so there's gonna be a little bit of a vertical component to the force, and it's gonna be positive because it's headed upward. If it was downward, then it would be negative. For our lever, we're gonna be given the length of the lever, we'll call that the hypotenuse, or I'm sorry, not the length of the lever necessarily, but the distance between the pivot point and the point where the force is applied, and the angle of the lever. And we're gonna use some basic trigonometry to figure out the X and Y components of our lever. One thing that I like to say in terms of visualizing this, and especially visualizing the fact that it's only gonna happen in two dimensions, is that our lever is an elbow, not a shoulder. So put your arm out right now and just bend it by the elbow, only the elbow. Don't move your shoulder at all. In fact, put your other palm on your shoulder and feel that it is not moving and just move your elbow. Now you might feel like your bicep move a little bit, but that's, that's not your shoulder joint, right? Clamp, clamp down on your shoulder joint and feel that it is not moving. Your elbow joint only moves in two dimensions. Your elbow itself cannot rotate. So I hope you're moving your arm around with me right now. Now, if you're like, no, 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 my elbow rotates. No, nope, you're doing it from your shoulder. Or you're like, either you have a broken something or other, or you're maybe hyperflexible. For most people, your elbow is only going to bend in two dimensions, and that is how it probably should work. Your shoulder is kind of interesting too, interesting in that it moves in three dimensions, but we are only going to be working with elbows, not shoulders in this example. Okay, so let's see some numbers for this problem and then let's go ahead and calculate it. In fact, I'll go ahead and run the code right now and then we'll talk through it. So the angle of our lever is going to be 45 degrees and we create a variable right there. And our hypotenuse or the length of the lever or the distance between the pivot and the force is going to be 12. And I'm not sure what the units are, I apologize for that. And then I'm gonna display out that information with this code right here. And all these numbers are like given in the setup of the problem. 
uh, in the book. Again, MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition, if you want to check that out. We are going to need to use SOKOTOA to figure out the X and Y components of our lever. So reminder, SOKOTOA is just a way of remembering that the sine of the angle equals the opposite side of your right triangle divided by the hypotenuse. Similarly, the cosine of the angle equals the adjacent side of the triangle divided by the hypotenuse. Now, I just rewrote it right here to emphasize that opposite and adjacent, I'm going to refer to as r underscore y and r underscore x in terms of my variable names. And you will see that if we solve for r underscore y, it's just multiplying both sides by the hypotenuse. And if I solve for r underscore x, it's just multiplying both sides by the hypotenuse. So r underscore x equals the hypotenuse times the cosine in degrees of the angle. And r sub y equals something similar but uses the sine in degrees. And then our third dimension, we're just gonna set it as zero. We're dealing with elbows, not shoulders. Our force vector, again, these numbers are either given or you have to calculate them some other way, but here I'm just giving them to you, is a strong force to the left, so negative 100 in the x component. The order does matter. It's gotta go x, y, and z, or something else that's consistent at least, and you know which one is which. So I'm using x and then y, a little bit of upward force, and then no force in the z direction. So there's my force vector, just three numbers. Here's my uh, lever vector, r sub x, r sub y, and r sub z. This vector you could also have formulated this way, but I only know that through some trigonometry and you could figure it out through some of your own trigonometry. So that's just there as like a little bit of side information. And then finally, we calculate the moment of force by taking the cross product of those two vectors. That's it, that's the whole thing. The vast majority of this code is in the setup and the understanding of what's going on. And when I, you know, if you're one of my students, you'll get a homework question like this. You got to make sure you set it up carefully. The actual calculation, I mean, MATLAB does all the work for you right there. And we see in the output that this is our force vector. This is our lever vector. And our moment of force about the point is slightly off the screen, but it's 1018.2 right there. And all the other components are zero. So zero, zero and then 1018.2 right here. And I believe we want to understand it as a scalar value, and these zeros, like you're always gonna get that. It's not saying that there's some sort of force in the z direction. Um, that's my understanding. But again, I, I don't actually understand. I haven't studied the physics or engineering uh, as well as perhaps I should. All right, and that's all for this video. That ends the cross product section. In the next video, we will be solving systems of equations.